Well, hi, everyone. It's me by myself again today on our Facebook Live. Uh, this is our public Facebook page, just a fair warning. Um, and you know how we start. We always start with a welcome, welcome and hello. And I'm saying that to you, and I'd like you to say that back to me so I know that we have actually succeeded in entering into cyber world and we are actually truly on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate you. Karen is our staff member who helps me. Um, I am not a great multitasker and I have a very hard time looking in the camera and looking at the chat and looking at my notes and looking at everybody else and looking at the feed. So we have to have a helper here to ferret some of the questions that we get here. So thank you so much. Good to see you again, Laureen. You are Really learning a lot, I hope, uh, being so present in our Facebook Lives. And Julie, welcome. Welcome. We're glad to see you here. And Faith, again, good morning. Today our topic is, can I live with someone who is indifferent to my feelings? And we sort of touched on that a little bit last night when we talked about staying well and what that really looks like. It doesn't look like a good marriage. It looks like you're not going insane and you're not getting sick if you choose to stay in this marriage. We're going to, go, we're going to dive a little deeper into that topic. Hi, Janice. Good to see you. Um, can I live with someone? So we're not even talking about your spouse, well, but for most of you, it is your spouse, but it might be your adult child. It might be your adult parent. <laughs> right? It might be a roommate situation that you have to live with. Um, if you do separate, can I live with someone who is indifferent to my feelings? Can I live with someone who's indifferent to my feelings? So let's just take a, a poll. Yes or no? Can you or can't you? Yes or no? Leanne, you're there. You should be honest with me. <laughs> um, can I live with someone who's indifferent to my feelings? Yes or no? Yes or no? Can I? Or can't I? What do you think? Put it in the chat. All right. We've got a vote for no. One vote for no. Yes or no. Can you live peaceably with someone who's indifferent to your feelings? And maybe we need to define indifferent. Rachel says yes and no. Maybe we need to define indifferent. Okay. Because indifferent doesn't mean cruel and mocking toward your feelings. That's pretty tough. Although I'm going to show you how you can live with someone who might be that way. But indifferent means whether or not they're emotionally or physically unsafe. Right, Grace. So, so if they're indifferent, what we mean by indifferent is they just don't respond. They don't respond. So you tell them that you're hurting, that if this really bothers you, that you need something, you're tired of something, you want something to change, you're sharing your feelings, you're sharing your heart. And they're like crickets. <laughs> or they're like, you know, I don't know, what do you want me to do? They're, they're just non-responsive. They're not changing. They're not taking action. They're not showing compassion. They're not giving you a hug. They're not initiating any change or contact or comfort. They're just like a stone. They're like a stone. They're indifferent. Can you live with someone who's indifferent? All right. Kristen said, yes, just accept there is no emotional intimacy. He's de you have to detach. He's detached. Okay. So yes. So this is what I want to talk about today, because some of you might have to live with someone who's indifferent to your feelings for a season or for a bit. And I want to teach you how to do that if that's the case. Okay. So, so yes, you can, you can't live with someone who's cruel and mocking and, um, and belligerent and, uh, you know, all of that around your feelings. So I'm going to show you a little chart of the five levels of communication. It's not mine. I got it years ago when I was in graduate school a long time ago. <laughs> um, and I've remembered it ever since. And I don't think it's been publicized much on the internet, but I think it's really helpful. So I'm going to, I'm going to share this with you. And this is true for every relationship. Okay. Every relationship has different levels of communication and you may need to change your level of communication and expectation for communication with the person you live with, even if he's your husband, even if you're, he's your husband. Okay. And I, I wrote down the, uh, the communication levels, but I'm going to liken it to physical levels of communication, because I think we can relate to that. And when I teach this for men and women, they really understand this in a pretty powerful way. So here are five levels of communication. So the first level is superficial chit chat. We do this kind of at church or in greeting. Oh, hi, how are you? Fine. How are you? What's new? Nothing. And it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a greeting. It's just a greeting. It's a superficial, polite chit chat. 
We're not really listening to what they said. I remember one time in my church, my pastor asked me, he goes, hey, Leslie, how's it going? I said, I'm terrible. And he said, good, good. He didn't listen. And I, I was just playing with him. But he, he didn't listen because it's not that level of communication. So I wouldn't say he didn't care about my feelings. He just wasn't expecting me to share at this level up here, right? So can you do superficial chit chat with someone you live with? Hey, hi, how are you? You know, not really asking how they are, but just making that superficial chit chat, right? Probably, probably, right? There usually isn't any hostility up there. All right, the next level. A lot of families just, so if we think about this, this is very physically, it's very uh, superficial. You don't, you know, you don't touch each other. You just, you know, stand next to each other. You don't stand too close right? It's very superficial. It's not terribly friendly. It's not unfriendly. It's just not overly friendly. All right. This one facts. So here's the facts. It's raining (laughs) or, you know, we got an IRS check in the mail today or Tommy has to go to soccer or we have no milk in the fridge. Uh, Do you have time to pick it up? These are, these are facts, news, informational communication. It's like a handshake. It's You don't tell everybody the facts about everything, but you're communicating at a little bit of a deeper level than just superficial chit. It's like a handshake. It's a friendly, a friendly, you know, banter back and forth about the facts and the news. You're talking about the weather. You're talking about the sports. You're talking about Trump. You're talking about what's going on in the news. You're not giving any personal commentary. You're just giving what's up. Right. And some people live together like this their whole life. (laughs) It's very boring, but you do because they don't want to go any deeper. It's like a handshake. It's not terribly intimate. It's not cruel. It's just not close. Right? And if you're living in a destructive marriage with a destructive person, that may be as deep as you can go safely because they're indifferent to the rest of this or they're actually mean when you go there because they don't know how to go there or they're not comfortable there or for whatever reason. We're not going to make up a story about why. We just know they don't go there. Right? So here's two levels of communication. Then we go a little deeper and we share our thoughts and ideas. Now, let's just separate this. Have you ever been in a church setting? I have, so it really resonates with me. Have you ever been in a church Bible study, ladies Bible study or a church setting or some other, you know, maybe a parent-teacher meeting or something that you're at and you're with people that you know, you're past superficial chit-chat, you're past the facts and news, you're discussing a topic. <laughs> you had Bible study or you're discussing a political topic or you're discussing, you know, something, you know, whatever. And you have a different opinion than someone else. And you share it. Like, you know, I don't really think Bathsheba and David, (laughs) I said this back in the day, I don't really think David and Bathsheba had an affair. I think David raped her. And it was like, what? (laughs) You're crazy, Leslie. That's not true. That's not what the Bible says. So sometimes when you have a thought and you share it, it's not received very well, right? And what happens when you're made fun of or you're criticized for your different opinion? Well, either you get louder or you tend to shut down, all right, depending on your personality and your confidence. And so this, is a, this can be a deal breaker that you start feeling like, ooh, I don't feel safe around these people because they don't, I don't think they have to agree with me, but at least they have to be respectful about disagreeing, right? When someone disagrees disrespectfully or makes fun of you or mocks you or, you know, shuns you because you have a different thought than they do, or you have a different idea than that, this begins to affect intimacy. So if we think about this in the physical level, there's no physical contact here. Here's a handshake. And here is someone is trying to be a little friendly or maybe patting your back or, you know, putting their hand on your shoulder and and you go like that. Well, if some, or they do that to you, it's like, get away from me right? Then, then you're not likely to want to talk anymore. You're not likely to want to go any further. It feels unsafe uh, psychologically, right? So, so be careful when you're interacting with people in your relationships that if they do disagree with you, that you're not disrespectful. And notice when you share a different idea or a different thought, not terrible, you know, intimate stuff, but just political thought or religious thought or news thought about whatever's going on in the news today. We have lots of different opinions on those things, right? Can we be respectful to each other? Can we be curious? Like, wow, I didn't think about it that way. What made you think that this was a rape and not an affair? The NIV Bible says David has Bathsheba's affair and then have a conversation about it, right? Be curious. 
So this is a really a, a kind of a turning point in relational closeness. And if you can't listen to each other's thoughts and ideas without <clears throat> contempt and mocking and criticism and rejection, then, then you're not going to go any further, right? If, if someone shakes off your touch on the shoulder, they're not about to reach in and give you a peck on the cheek, right? They're just not going to do it. We're just too <clears throat> rejection averse. We're not going to do that. So then the next level, if this seems pretty safe, <clears throat> excuse me, if this seems pretty safe, then we may go down to feelings and needs. Like we feel a little safe. You, you accepted my thoughts and I have a feeling or I have a need, right? So I feel, I feel insulted when you criticized me or I feel hurt that you don't listen to me or I feel lonely because you're so busy working. These are, these are a little bit more vulnerable. This is vulnerable too. Sharing your thoughts and feelings is vulnerable depending on the audience, right? But this is even more vulnerable, right? And so here's what we're talking about. When I go here and he's indifferent, he doesn't respond, he doesn't meet my need, he doesn't show care, he doesn't show comfort, he's indifferent, as is if I didn't even say it. Or maybe he does get mocking and critical. You're so sensitive. What's wrong with you? Are you crazy? Right? That kind of thing. Well, then, of course, you don't feel safe. This would be like physical intimacy. When you kiss someone, they go, ew, you kiss terrible. You taste terrible. You know, you're not about to let them do anything else to you, and you're not going to be around them, right? When you, when you get close to someone, you want them to receive you. You don't want them to reject you, all right? And so, so this would be a total turnoff physically if you were in the bedroom. And definitely, you know, it's a, it's a turnoff. Um, or if someone criticized you in the bedroom, let's say you're taking off your clothes and you're, you know, you're, this is the first time you're together physically, you know, your wedding night and your husband says, oh my gosh, I never noticed that you had so much cellulite on your butt. Or you do have a lot of cellulite on your butt. It's like, what? <laughs> I'm not going there with you anymore. Like, I can't take off my clothes in front of you because you're so critical, right? And so all of us are flawed. So when we take off our clothes, there is going to be something wrong. And if someone says, oh, that's icky, that makes us feel shame and, and pull away. So this is a real important chart for all of you in any relationship. So can you live here? Can you live above this line with someone if, if they can't go below the line? That maybe, maybe there's certain thoughts that you could share. All right. Like, <clears throat> I think the house needs to be painted. What do you think? <laughs> maybe some kind of those kind of thoughts. You know, I think I'd like to go to a different church. What do you think? Um, or I think I'd like to have um, pizza for dinner. What do you think? All right. So you're being a little vulnerable there. Not terribly, but you probably could go there with some things without getting a lot of kickback, either from whoever you're living with. But maybe you can never go here. Maybe that's just not possible in your house with the person you're living with, whether it's a spouse or whether it's an adult child or an adult parent, or you're in a roommate situation. Because every time you've gone there, it's been icky. It's felt shaming, rejecting, um, critical, um, and, and disappointing. So, so, so my question then is, can you live with someone just there? Can you? Yeah. Can you? Because sometimes you can't even live here because all you have to agree with everything he thinks or you're in the doghouse, right? Or you're not allowed to have an opinion that's different than him or he's calling that disrespect, right? And so <clears throat> I think you can if you have to, if you have to, because we talked yesterday, there are some reasons why you have to stay for now, small children, finances, medical issues where you need insurance, those kind of things. You're not prepared to work, all right? So if you have to stay and stay well, you're going to have to learn to stay above the waterline, all right? Here and here. If you just communicate in those areas, it might be a whole lot safer for you than if you go into those other areas. So what does that require of you? Well, it requires for you to do two things. <clears throat> the first thing it requires for you is to get some support outside the house. You cannot do this alone because you need people in your life where you can 
talk about your feelings. You can talk about your ideas. You can be close to. You need that. God has hardwired us for that. It may not be your husband, but you need that. And so the person who has to care about your needs, most of all, is you, not necessarily your husband. And so you have to get some support because that's one of the things that you need. All right, you need support. You need people in your life. They might not be living with you right now, but you need people in your life who care about you and do care about these things. The second thing that you need to learn is you need to learn to detach, detach from other people who are indifferent to you. And what I mean by detach is not hate them, close down, not care. It means accept reality, that they don't care about you the way you want them to, that they're not going to meet your needs. And so you're going to detach and accept that and not invite them to meet your needs, not beg them to meet your needs, not ask them to meet your needs, not expect them to meet your needs, even if they're your husband, right? Even if they're your husband. You're going to detach yourself from your need for them to be considerate of your thoughts, considerate of your feelings and meeting your needs. You're going to detach from that. doesn't mean that you're going to detach from being polite or kind or caring about their needs, right? Because that may not be who you want to be, all right? So you may care if they share with you, you know, a, a problem. You may ask, do you want some help solving that? Or do you want, you know, do you want a hug? Or if you feel comfortable doing that? You can still do that if you want to. You don't have to, but you can care about their needs. But you are not begging, waiting, requiring, hoping, begging, you know, whatever the, it is for them to meet your needs in those levels, right? And, and that requires some work for you to let go because, of course, you expect it. You married the person. That's what they promised to do. I promise to love and cherish you, forsake all others holding you close to me. You know, it's just crazy because that was a promise they made, but they can't keep it and they haven't kept it. And reality shows you that. And yet you can't move out. You can't leave for whatever reason, good reasons and sometimes even bad reasons. You're not leaving. You're not leaving that relationship. And so you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't go here, who doesn't care about these things. They might be very superficial themselves. And in, in all fairness, there are some people who never learn to go there. Their whole family never goes there. And it scares the bejeebies out of them. And they would rather die a stone than learn how to go there. And you're not going to change that. You can have some compassion for that, but you're not going to get them to meet your needs because they're not going there. They don't know how. And for a man, for a man just, just a little tip here. When a woman doesn't know how to do something, it doesn't feel shameful. When I don't know how to get to some place that I need to go, I have no problem asking someone for directions. If I don't know how to solve a problem, I have no problem asking for help. Men are wired a little different. They like to feel very competent. And when they don't know something, they don't want to tell anybody they don't know it because that makes them feel small. And so if they don't know how to do emotions, if they don't know how to talk about feelings, they would sooner bite your head off than admit that they don't know how to do that. They would sooner blame you that something's wrong with you for needing that than for them to say, I never learned how to do that and I feel stupid. I don't know how to talk about my feelings. They're not going to do that. And so, so that might help you to have some compassion for them that they are broken. They're broken in those ways and they're not willing to get do the work to get fixed. And you can't fix them. All you can do is do the thing that you can do, which is two things. Care that you do have feelings and thoughts so you don't shut down and become a stone. You care even if they don't care. And you find support elsewhere for those parts of your life. And that may help you stay well if someone is indifferent to your feelings. Let me read some of the chat uh, comments here. Carrie says, detaching is so hard, but once you've accomplished it, it is so freeing. Yes, yes, it is. Sue, amen. We can be beautifully civil around people who are not treating us well or treating us immaturely. And I love that because this is, this is so important to your self-esteem and your growth. When you can handle other people in a way that makes you feel proud of yourself, wow, they acted like a jerk, but I acted like a civil, decent human being. I treated them like I would want to be treated. 
I didn't treat them like they deserved. I treated them like I, I would have wanted to be treated. And I feel good about that. You may not have a good relationship with them, but you might have a really good relationship with you and your heavenly father. And that really matters. And that really matters when you let yourself deteriorate to their level. Paul says, you're going to bite and devour each other. Watch out. You're going to destroy each other. Don't do that. Don't be a part of that. Do not let evil overcome you. Um, Eddie says, ha ha, Grace, that was a huge issue with us. He insisted his version of the facts was correct and there was no other perspectives. Yeah, said it was psychobabble. So when someone won't let you have your opinion, and that's happening a lot in our culture, right? It's not just in destructive marriages. It's in a destructive culture right now. If you have an opinion that's different. So if I sat next to someone on the airplane who was a big Trump supporter, a big Biden supporter, I'm not a supporter of either one of them. Um, but if they were, instead of trying to put them down, what I would say is, what, what, what do you see that's so good in them that you are so wholeheartedly on their side? Help me to understand that because I don't see that. What's good? About, I would be curious. I would ask some curious questions. I wouldn't argue. I wouldn't, it's not my job to change your mind, right? And so if we can have civil conversations with people who see things differently and they're willing to have that with us, then our whole world could be a little bit better, couldn't it? And our families could be, but, but when someone has to be right and someone has to be wrong and someone has to be good and someone has to be bad, there is no conversation because it's about win-lose. I'm going to win and you're going to lose. It's not about understanding. It's not about learning. It's about separating and dividing. And that's not good. You see that happening in our nation. It's not good in a nation. It's not good in a relationship. I've lived with a man for a long time that we have a lot of different opinions on things. And we disagree about a good portion of things as well. And we do things very differently. But what we do have that is the glue that holds it together is respect. And we can live with each other's differences because we don't have to see things the same way. And I don't have to have 100% agreement and he doesn't have to have 100% agreement. So I think this is really an important discipline that you learn even if you end up leaving a relationship because it is unsafe, that these are pieces that you can learn to become more mature and healthy. All right, let's see what other comments we have. <clears throat> Leanne repeats, no begging, no waiting, no requiring connection, no being cherished and deeply cared for. Letting go of these desires is big, hard work. You do not need, nor can you do this work in isolation. Leanne, if you want to hop on, <clears throat> uh, Leanne's one of our coaches, and I didn't know you were free here. If you want to hop on and, and share some of your experiences, that would be wonderful. I'll put you on. So just go over to stream right if you have the link. Um, Lori Lee says, neurodivergent spouses don't talk about feelings, nor are they capable of empathy. Yeah. And so if you can accept that these are, so if someone is, if your husband is neurodivergent and he's hardworking and he's responsible and he's honest and he can communicate at these two places pretty honestly, pretty well, pretty respectfully, he's probably not in this level two. All right. He's probably not going to give you any of this stuff, right? He's not capable unless he recognizes, oh, wow, I don't have a spot in my brain that learns this naturally. I've got to really work at learning what that looks like and maybe even just do the actions of what that looks like. Oh, when someone's crying, I don't just stand there. I give them a hug and they may have to learn how to do that. And that may feel really uncomfortable, but they can learn if they want to. But if he's a really great guy in those other areas, maybe you have to accept that he is going to be maybe a C minus or D minus in some of the other areas. And this is part of living with a fallible human being, which we all are, right? Which we all are. We, know, we don't all come to the, to the table with a, a scorecard on every area of our life, right? And neither does our husband. All right. Yeah. Let me see what else. Um, Lindsay says, I have felt like detaching has been a coping mechanism for not being overwhelmed, but I'm not sure how long the marriage can last if he is not putting in the effort. So here's what we talk about staying well. It's the marriage lasts legally. The marriage is sort of either superficially polite or literally dead 
that you're living like roommates in, but you're living as polite, respectful roommates in two separate bedrooms. And there's not a closeness and there's not an intimacy and there's not a big friendship even. But you're able to do that because you're able to accept this is how it is. But I also get the perks of having my grandkids come over for Christmas and being a family, of having medical insurance, of having enough money in the bank to pay all of our bills. And he gets those perks too, right? And for some people, that may be what they need to do, either for a season or for a longer time, because they're not prepared to move out and live alone, or they can't because of medical reasons. And so I think it's really important to give women an idea that they may have to um, do some work of their own to be able to do that because their options are limited. And so I think this is, this is the reality of life sometimes is that we don't have good options. Like, you know, I think I, I shared, I have a friend who had just had um, head surgery. I was visiting her last night and, you know, she had melanoma. And so her options are really bad, bad, worse, dead. Her doctor said, <laughs> either you accept that you're going to lose your hair and you're going to have a big icky thing on the top of your head of transplanted back skin on your head with no hair, or you're going to die. Those are your two options, bad and worse. <laughs> There's no good option. What do you pick? You pick one and then you have to live with it, right? And sometimes you're in a place where I can't leave right now for good reasons, or I'm just too scared and I'm not ready. Okay, well then if you're going to stay, learn how to stay well not have a good marriage, stay well so that you don't have a nervous breakdown or get sicker and sicker and sicker because you keep begging for something you're not going to get. And so you keep getting rejected and rejection. The pain of rejection is studies have shown with MRIs and other kinds of imaging. It's as painful as physical pain. So don't keep setting yourself up for rejection when you know he's not going to give you what you want. Care about your feelings. All right. He can't do that. He won't do that. He refuses to do that. So you care about your feelings and guard your heart above all else. It is the wellspring of life. And I'm not saying shut down your feelings. Just protect your feelings. And there is biblical, to have boundaries for your feelings. There's biblical support for that. Guard your heart. And it also says, don't cast your pearls, which is your your emotional vulnerability, deep knowing, don't cast your pearls before swine because they will turn on you and trample you with it. So if you know that and accept that, then you live with someone as a polite stranger and you meet each other's superficial needs and call it a day, but you're not getting sicker and sicker because you're not begging or expecting or hoping or waiting for something else to show up. Okay. All right, so let's go to some questions. Let me just, as you, as Karen's putting the questions in the chat, let's just look and see what other people are saying. What about when you do treat them as you want to be treated, but they still make snide comments to you anyway, like they still verbally poke at you? Um, so if they're, if, if, so it might be that you're treating them in a way that they don't want to be treated, and that's why they're poking at you. So, so I would just say, wow, it sounds like you don't like that. I won't do that anymore. Right. So maybe you would like a hug at the you know door. And so you give them a hug and they say, oh, is that all I get? Yeah. You're so such as cold as ice. Oh, it sounds like that doesn't work for you. You don't you don't want to hug. I would have liked a hug. And so maybe that's not good for him to, for you to give him that if he's putting out porcupine quills. Right. And so I would just stop. So just because you would like just like I would like chocolate ice cream, somebody else might not like chocolate ice cream. So I don't want them to give me the ice cream they would like. I want them to give me the ice cream I would like, <laughs> right? That's what we give people as gifts that we would like. But so you treat people as you would like. So I, I would make it a little bit broader with respect. And if he doesn't want affection, then I wouldn't give him affection, right? If you wanted affection, then, you know, understand that I understand what you're trying to say, that you're trying to treat him like, oh, I would like affection, so I'll give him affection. But if someone is saying that I don't like that, and they're saying it in crooked ways. They're saying it in demeaning ways. Instead of just saying, that doesn't really work for me because of the state of our relationship or I'm not a touchy-feely person. I don't, I don't like rubs on my back. Um, instead of being honest about that, they're criticizing you. I would just stop. Sounds like you don't like that. I won't do it anymore. No problem. Right? <clears throat> 
Let's see. Katie says, everything is very black and white with him. He is right, and that's it. There is no other alternative. And Katie, when that's true, then you're going to always be wrong, and you're going to always be the bad guy. So understand that. So when we go back to here, sharing your thoughts and ideas, probably my guess is even if you did do that, they would always be ultimately his idea. If he thought that it was a good idea, somehow he would forget that you had it, and he would it would be his idea. But But understand that you are living with someone who probably is more on the narcissistic scale and they aren't able to really validate other people much other than how they serve them. I can validate my phone as long as it serves me well and I don't validate my phone if it gives me any hassles. And so you're more of an object in this relationship. And so you may have to just stay right here for however long you need to and keep taking your temperature kind of thing. How am I doing? How am I doing? If you're choosing to stay well for your children right now or for your finances right now. But I would please, and you've been on here a couple of times, make a plan so that if he discards you, and he may, um, if you're not giving him his supply anymore, he will discard you and then you'll be out on your own and you haven't made a plan to take care of you and yourself and your children. So start making a plan now while you can because even though you may not leave right now, he may discard you, which happens often too, when you stop catering to them, right? So if my phone doesn't work, I'm going to discard it. And if you're not working like he wants you to work to, to meet his needs, then you might be disposable and replaceable. You are disposable and replaceable for that kind of person. All right. All right. I'm going to answer some questions that are in the chat here. If you want to ask an anonymous question, go to lesliebernick.com forward slash question forward slash if you don't want to put it in the Facebook uh, chat here. All right. What about when you, okay, oh, I already got that one. How do you stay well and keep things safely superficial? But anytime you ask a question or ask for help with something, he takes as an attack and gets offended, even simple questions. And any curious question is just received as an attack. Even when I start with just a friendly question, how do I stay well when kids hear these interactions and then mom gets blamed as overly critical or wanting to argue? That's the last thing I want. So what is that telling you? He doesn't want to engage in any kind of conversation that is required beyond superficial, right? So even asking curious questions is not okay for him. So there are some people who are so defensive that they see a question as a means to trap them. And they're telling them a story of that's what you're doing. And so they're going to become defensive and go on the attack. It's not your fault. He sees it that way. But if it's okay with you, I'm going to erase this and I'm going to write something else on here. So here, if you didn't write it down, you do want to write it down. It's superficial chit chat, facts and news, thoughts and ideas, feelings, ideas, emotional vulnerability and intimacy. Because you can share your feelings without necessarily showing your feelings. So you could say, or I have a need you know, I would, I would like, uh, I would like to um, have more closeness between us. You're sharing that. I would, I feel lonely. So you can say that just like that. And here you would be showing that you would be crying. You would be more vulnerable that way. Okay. All right. So I'm going to show something now. I just forgot what I was going to show. So let me just raise this and see if I can. Oh, I know what I was going to show. So I want to, I want to show you something that we all do, but it may help you understand your husband and yourself better. Not to excuse it. You just need to know you're doing it. And he may not know he's doing it. All right. We all do it, but he may not know he's doing it. All right. So all right. So I'm just going to do some shorthand here. So we have three sequences in a conversation or in a event. So we have the facts. Okay. All right. So the facts, what are the facts? Facts are I just got diagnosed, with, I didn't, but let's make up a story, but make up a fact. I just got diagnosed with breast cancer. Or the fact is my husband doesn't want to work on his porn problem, okay? Or the fact is uh, I've got divorced. Or the fact is um, I was sexually abused as a child. It could be whatever fact it is, a, a, a verifiable fact. This is the facts, okay? 
Then we, sell, we tell ourselves a story about the facts. Okay, so here's the facts. I'm stuck in traffic. <laughs> right? Whatever the facts are. And then we tell ourselves a story. It could be optimistic. It could be pessimistic. It could be true. It could be not true. It could be whatever. We tell ourselves a story about the facts. And that story is actually causing our response. Okay? The story, not the facts. Okay, so let's, let's play with this a little bit, okay? So the facts are that um, I got an F on my paper. The story I'm telling myself is I am too stupid to do this course, that I am never going to understand this math. I just can't. So what's going to be my response? I'm going to drop out. I don't want to fail. I'm going to drop out of the course. Well, is my story true? Probably not. Or my friend who just got melanoma. That's the facts. The story is, I'm going to look so ugly. I'm never going to find a wig that's going to fit. I'm going to be miserable the rest of my life. If she thinks that way, how's that going to affect her responses and her personality? Right? Or what about the facts of, I'm in a traffic jam. And, I'm, you know, I might miss my, my flight. And I'm telling myself a story. Oh, everybody's going to be so disappointed in me. I feel like a failure. I can't do anything. I should have left earlier. What's wrong with me? God, why aren't you helping me? You don't even care that I'm out in this traffic jam and I'm supposed to be at this event and speaking. You know, none of that's true. <laughs> this is true. None of that's true. But it is working me up. It is working me up, right? So your husband, he hears what you said. And he's telling himself a story about what you said. So you're asking him a curious question, like, <clears throat> what do you think about blah, 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 blah? And he's going, she's trying to trap me. She's trying to make me look foolish because I don't know the answer to that. She's trying to make me say something that then she can argue with me and put me down and make me look like a fool. I'm not giving her that satisfaction. Arr! And he bites at you, not because of what you said, but because of the story he told himself about what you said. And you can't change someone's story, all right? The only person who can change that is them. That's why the Bible tells us, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, because we all tell ourselves stories. Even the Israelites told themselves stories. Do you remember in the passages where God, and I won't take the time to look at it, it's Deuteronomy somewhere, Deuteronomy 6 or 7, somewhere there. Here's the facts. You're going to the promised land. Okay? You're going to the promised land. That was the, the facts. And he said, hey, Israelites, don't tell yourself a story that you're going to the promised land because you are such great Jews, you are such great people. Don't tell yourself that story because if you tell yourself that story, what are you going to feel? You're going to feel proud. <laughs> I don't want you to feel proud. I want you to feel grateful, humble. Tell yourself the truth. We are entering into this because of God's goodness. Tell yourself that story, not this story. And so God is constantly correcting our thoughts. Don't tell yourself when you're scared that God isn't here. God is here. I'm here. I'm right here with you. I will never leave you and forsake you. But the facts are, I just got, you know, in a bad situation. I feel all alone. God, you're not here. I can't see you. You're not really here. That's not true. But if you believe that, if you believe your story, that's how you're going to feel and how you're going to respond. So this is, a, this is a marvelous tool that we teach in our coaching groups to women. Um, but, but you can, we all have the problem. So it's a human problem. We all tell ourselves stories about why. Why is he acting that way? Why did she ask me that? Right? Why is this happening to me? And our story may not be factual. Our story may be just a made-up story based on our history. And so to answer your question, your husband's telling himself a very negative story about you. He's got a negative script in his head, and you're not going to change that. So knowing that, you can do one of two things. You can start your question with, hey, I'm not trying to start a fight, and I'm not trying to be critical. I just am curious about... You can see if you can preempt his story by preempting your question with those caveats. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings when I say this, but I really think, you know, whatever, so that you can help someone get a grip of their story if they're, if they're in there. But <clears throat> if this keep happening, then understand it's not about you. It's about something in him that he's not aware of. Remember, we talked about self-awareness being the key to maturity. And if you don't, if you don't become self-aware of the story you tell yourself about what's going on, you can't fix it. You can't change it, right? And therefore, it determines the outcome because your story is what will create the rest of the steps that you take. 
I remember working with a woman in church before I ever got into this. I was teaching Sunday school before I ever got into dealing with women in abusive marriages. This was 30 years ago. And 35 years ago, I was teaching Sunday school. And she said to me <laughs> about her husband, she goes, I'm getting a divorce. And I said, it, really? I mean, 35 years ago, most of us didn't get divorced. Most people didn't get divorced, even for good reasons. I said, why? Because I knew her husband. He was in Sunday school, too. She goes, <laughs> so here's the facts. He's too nice. And I said, oh. I said, why is being too nice a bad thing? Here's her story. He's just trying to make me look bad to the children. He's trying to show me up. He's, he's so nice and good that everybody thinks in comparison to him that I'm awful. I don't think anybody was thinking that. I never thought that, but in her head, she had created a whole story about his niceness. She could never live up to his niceness, so she was going to get a divorce because of it. And there were probably some other things as well. I'm not saying that was the only reason, but that was the only reason she told me. But she was, she was having a problem with him being so nice because it made her feel inadequate. And it made her feel like he was doing that on purpose to make her feel inadequate. Maybe he was, and maybe he wasn't. That might have been a story in her head. Okay, enough of that counseling talk. <laughs> um, all right, let me answer another question. Can I watch this later? I'm at work right now. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can watch the replay. I have discovered that my husband displays covert narcissistic behavior patterns. The worst is ignoring gaslighting indifference and not being able to work out issues. That's his problem. Her problem, I have not detached well. I have detached with bitterness. I have researched so much that says he will not change. And that has been my experience in this six-year marriage. If I do my work, detach well. Do you think he can change his destructive patterns? I've heard he may not be able to adapt to the lack of supply from me. Yeah, you don't know. You don't know what he's willing and not willing to do because right now he's not willing. So that's what you do know. You don't know five years from now, 25 years from now. He might say, boy, am I paying a lot of stupid tax for my miserable life? If you read through the book of Proverbs, the Bible talks about that. At the end of your life, you will groan. You will say, I was a fool. I didn't listen to my instructors. I didn't listen to people who were trying to help me. Now my life is in utter ruins. Yeah, but at 80, when you think that and realize that, it's kind of late to go back and change your marriage, right? So I don't know when he will or if he will wake up. So I think you have to live with what is. And here's going back to this little chart that I wrote. The facts are that he's not willing to wake up now. The facts are he's not willing to care now. The facts are whatever they are, all right? So for me to tell myself a story, oh, if I just do my work, he will change. He might and he might not. So you might try. Let me see. Let me try to do my work. Let me clean up my side of the street. Let me see if I can get stronger and how that impacts in our interaction, right? And I think that's a really good first step. We teach that in our groups. Do your work first and see how that impacts things. So as you do your work and get stronger, it'll impact him in one of two ways, right? It'll impact him in that he will feel threatened by your newfound courage, your lack of narcissistic supply, your um, not courage to speak out against him or blame him or yell at him or those, but your courage to not get engaged into the destructive dance, not get snookered by his gaslighting, not kowtow to his headship in a scared child posture. By you doing your work, he's going to feel threatened. Like, oh my gosh, I'm losing my power and control over this person. And one and two things will happen. He'll feel threatened and so he will get worse. He will turn into a regular overt narcissist because the covert doesn't work to keep you under wraps anymore. And he will, he will bare his teeth, right? Instead of just more of the sneaky tactics, he will, he will be more aggressive in trying to get you to go back to the way you were. Or if he's truly not a narcissist and has some potential to change, he might come to a bit of envy and jealousy in a good way of, wow, you're actually a more appealing person. And 
I'd like some of that maturity myself. How do I get some? And we've had some men who have said that to their wives as they've grown and changed. And I have to tell you that the only positive comments I've ever heard from men in these kind of relationships is thank you, not thank you for helping my wife silently endure my horrible treatment, but thank you for helping my wife get strong enough to not, to stand up for herself in a good way without demonizing me, but standing up for herself and doing the right thing and doing it well. And I begin to see, wow, she's an amazing woman. And if I don't get my act together, I'm going to lose her. And I've had a few of the men who written to me or stopped me in public places and said that. But I've never had a man stop me and say, my wife was so submissive and so, you know, such a pushover. It finally brought me to my senses that I was hurting her. Never, never, ever. And, you know, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but I don't think it happens when we allow and enable sin to flourish. So we don't know what's going to happen when you get stronger and you do your work. And that's where you have to decide is how long do I keep trying? And so that segues me into the workshop I haven't even talked about. Um, the workshop we're doing next Thursday. So I'm going to put the link up there. If you haven't registered for our workshop yet, you definitely want to come if this is an issue for you. How long do you keep trying? And what does that trying look like, right? So how long do you keep trying? You never stop trying to grow, right? I'm always growing and I'm not striving to grow. I'm just interested in growing. Right? When you're interested in growing, then you look at opportunities to grow, whether they be failures. That's an opportunity to grow. What did I do wrong? What can I learn from that? How can I not do that again? Or opportunities. You know, what class can I take? What book can I read? What person can I talk to? What thing can I do to help me get stronger in this area? Whatever area you're working on, whether it's, you know, a pickleball or art or personal development and growth, learning to tell the stories that you're telling yourself, learning to recognize those. So, so when we want to grow, when we want to change, that's an internal motivation. So nobody's telling me I have to. And if your husband doesn't have that, then it's not very likely that he will change. So how long do you keep trying? So, and what does that trying look like? And I will give you those markers. I will say, this is what it looks like. If you don't see this, don't have hope. This is what it looks like. If you don't see this, don't have hope. This is what it looks like. If you don't see this, I don't care what else you see, but if you don't see this, don't keep trying because it's not going to work. Keep trying to grow and be a better person, but don't keep trying to drag him along thinking he's going to come to his senses. When you don't see this and you don't see this and you don't see this, my experiences, they're not opening their eyes anytime soon, if at all, if at all, right? So I just encourage you to sign up for the workshop and attend live so that you can ask your questions if something feels confusing. You will get a workbook. You will get a list of verses that, because I won't take the time to go through them all in the workshop, but I'm compiling a list of Bible verses that tell you, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention to what? To their actions. What actions? I will show you in the workshop what actions. Okay, what actions do you need to see that they are beginning to make some changes? All right. All right. What scriptures can we find for biblical boundaries? <clears throat> Well, Lisa Turkhurst has just written an amazing new book called Good Boundaries, Goodbye. And she says that God established boundaries even in the Bible in Genesis. So I'm not going to go through all of her teaching. You can Google her, read her book, Good Boundaries, Goodbyes. It's an excellent book on boundaries. But the very first boundary God said is, hey, you can do all of this. You can eat the fruit of the garden. You can do what you want. You can name the animals. You can do this. And you can't do this. This one thing is a boundary. It's off limits. One boundary. God had it. So boundaries are in the Bible. They're throughout the Bible. God has uh, the boundaries of the sea and the land. The sea is boundaried. The land is boundaried. The sky, the earth, those are boundaries. So everything has its own place and its own role. And so there, there's a huge biblical support for boundaries. And uh, Lisa's book is a great book. So she's given you plenty of scripture references in that book. And I would highly encourage you to go to Amazon and get that book right now. Good boundaries, goodbye, if that's a question for you and the scriptural support for that. Also, her podcast talks a lot about that as well. What if your spouse accuses you of being a narcissist when he's showing behavior of being a narcissist? <clears throat> Well, 
it's like the pot calling kettle black or whatever they, of course they do that because they want to get you to self-reflect. So a narcissist does not self-reflect. Remember I told you that self-awareness and self-reflection are important qualities to maturity because you can't change anything if you don't reflect. So if someone tells me I have BO, I'm going to go, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to think they're ridiculous. I'm going to check. Do I have BO? Right? Because maybe they smelled something that I wasn't aware of. A narcissist, if you tell them they, you have BO, is not going to check. <laughs> That's just not what they do. They will attack you and demonize you for even thinking that they might have BO, right? It's not possible for me because I am Mr. Wonderful. So it's not even possible that I ever have BO. I don't have BO. And so there's a, di there's a different psyche of a narcissist. So someone who worries that they might be a narcissist is self-reflecting. They're not a narcissist, all right? Narcissists don't self-reflect other than in their glory stuff. They don't ever self-reflect on their bad stuff. They just can't. It's not possible for them to see that. They won't. And so <clears throat> when we reflect and we see our selfishness or we see our entitled attitudes, okay, you might have some of those. I do, right? Because I'm a human a sinner, <laughs> But it doesn't mean I'm a narcissist. It means I see them and I'm willing to self-correct. So if you're worried that you're a narcissist, you probably aren't. But he's, he's, he's playing a game with you. And the game is, hey, as soon as you ask me, as soon as you hold the mirror up to me and say, look at yourself, I'm going to flip the mirror and say, look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look at yourself. And people do that because they don't want to look at themselves, Right. And so instead of saying, oh, what, what do you see? Let me look at myself. Do I have, you know, eyeliner under my, under my eyes or do I have broccoli in my teeth? Or if I have to look at myself, what, what do I, what, what, we tend to look at ourselves. Like, what's wrong? Where a narcissist will flip the mirror and say, look at yourself. Who are you to tell me? You have this problem too, right? And so that's, that's what he's doing. And so I think you just have to get other people in your life whose voices you are also listening to, so that if they all said that, then I would pay attention. If just one person says that, then I would be a little bit more cautious. Okay? <clears throat> Do narcissists always discard? I believe my husband has narcissistic personality disorder, but he won't leave. I had to kick him out twice for his abusive behavior. We get back together, and it's the same problems. <clears throat> I've asked him to leave many times, but he won't go. He's only left when I've made him leave. He says he's staying for our child. And I tell them that's not enough for me. I would like him to leave willingly and amicably, but he doesn't want to do that. Um, so, so this isn't a discard because he would be leaving you. So when you tell him to leave, of course he's not going to leave if he's got it good there, right? So a, a discard is if he has the resources or the means to leave you or to replace you. And maybe he doesn't have those. Um, and so... You know, not all narcissists are wealthy CEOs or presidents of countries and those kind of things, but they have the resources to discard multiple women. Um, so he may be a narcissist or maybe not, and maybe you've just mislabeled him. Um, it sounds like he, um, you know, why don't you leave? Why don't you leave if you don't want to live that way? So I don't know the details here. Um, he's staying for your child. Is he a good child? Is he a good father? Is he a good father? How old is your child? Um, and that may not be enough for you. So why are you staying? Why are you continuing to endure? Why is it that he has to leave if you want him done or out? So I think those are multiple questions that I would have to ask to be able to give you a better answer on this. Um, I would like him to leave willingly. Wouldn't we all? I would like him to live <laughs> willingly and amicably, but he doesn't want to do that. And you can't make him. So what are your other options, huh? What are your other options? Right? Stay well. You leave well. You figure out what you need to do to fix this. Is it fixable? I don't know. I don't know enough details to give you any more answers than that. But you can't make him leave. He has every right to live in the house as you do, just like he can't make you leave. So you don't have the power to make him leave. Unless you file a PFA if he's physically abusive. Then the police will make him leave. But you don't have the power to make him leave. Okay? I am married to a sociopathic narcissist, according to our therapist, navigating the waters of leaving safely. Yes, please do. 
because these are the most dangerous. Trying to stay well by creating an exit plan. He's like a fisherman, though. He casts the bait, talking about a topic I'm interested in. I get excited. I want to talk. Before I know it, five to eight minutes in, he's verbally attacking me. Trying to be more cautious, but aware. This is exhausting. Any advice? Yeah, you have to recognize the bait, right? So if someone is throwing you bait and you know there's poison at the end of the line, why do you keep taking the bait? That's the question that you really need to work on with your therapist, that I'm still having hopium that he's going to do it different. Is that what it is? You know, that he that he's going to respect me, he's going to honor me, he's going to care about my thoughts and my feelings when he puts this juicy conversation topic in front of me? What if you just said next time, I'd love to see what happens if you just said, wow, that sounds interesting, but I'm not free to talk right now, or I'm not able to talk right now, or no thanks. What if you just didn't take the bait? I wonder what narcissistic tendencies would happen next. So I think you are the one who has to own that you keep taking the bait and then you keep getting hurt. So what have you not learned about taking that bait yet that you need to learn? You've taken the bait and you've gotten hurt. You've taken the bait, you've gotten hurt. You've taken the bait, you've gotten hurt. What do you need to change? Stop taking the bait, right? Stop taking the bait. It's like insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for different results. You're not getting different results. You're not getting a decent conversation. You're not getting affirmation. You're not getting validation. You're getting your head chopped off again and again and again. So how many times before you say, not going there? I see the bait. <laughs> I'm not going there. I know where it ends. Okay. You know, it's sort of like maybe reading Proverbs 5, you know, the bait of the wanton woman. She's out there, you know, tantalizing a man. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're so hot. I would love to be with you. And God is saying, don't take the bait. The end of the story is death. Don't go there. Right? I mean, I think that's the temptation to go there is, is there for you, but you have not sexually, but the conversationally, but in Proverbs five, it talks about sexually, you know, you're thinking, Oh, they, I'm so wonderful. They really want to have a relationship. They don't, they don't, they want your money and they're going to throw you away. He says, don't go there. Don't go there. And so I would just put that picture in your mind that he's seducing you to take the bait and you're naive enough to keep believing it. And you've got to wisen up and say, the bait looks pretty, but the end is icky. I don't want to go there. How do you know whether or not someone is a true narcissist? <clears throat> yes, Karen uh, shared in the feed that a professional need to provide an evaluation. That's the only way. I mean, you can't, you're not, just like you can't diagnose someone who has cancer. I mean, you can say they're really sick, something's wrong, but I can't say for sure what. Um, that's not your domain. Um, and I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous to label people. I think Lab labeling their behavior and labeling their strategies of what they do um, is enough to say, I don't want to live like this. I don't have to put a label on you as a sociopathic narcissist. And if someone else does, then understand it's dangerous. But I don't have to know that to know that you're dangerous. I live with you. I live with you. I, you know, somebody may be psychotic, you know, they're crazy, they're delusional, whatever. I might not know whether you're schizophrenic or you have a brain tumor or you're sugar is too high or too low or whatever is making you crazy. But I know you're crazy. I know you're crazy right now. I know you're not thinking rationally. So now what? I don't think you need to have a diagnosis in order for you to protect yourself. The behavior itself is enough evidence, whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> my husband is so stuck on the idea of my being submissive to him if we stay married. He says that if we disagree on an issue, then it's my biblical responsibility to follow him 51% versus 49%. In some areas that I don't trust him, I have refused to support or follow this way. Is that wrong? I think this is really hard because I do think that submission is an important discipline for all believers to practice, not just wives. Um, but it sounds like your husband hasn't matured to the point of valuing your opinion in areas where maybe he's weaker in and you don't trust him in. So for example, if, if my husband said, 
I think we need to do this to the house. I think it needs this work done. And I'm like, well, I don't really think we need to do that yet. That's not that important. That's a lot of money. I don't really want to spend that much money on that. And he says, no, I think this is really important. I probably would trust his judgment on that more than mine because he's proved trustworthy and more knowledgeable in those areas than me. So I probably would defer and say, I would submit. Okay. But if he were saying something about my business or my work that I'm pretty knowledgeable about and he wanted me to do it different and I would say no that's not what I want to do and I don't think you know as much as I know and I trust my judgment and this is what I'm going to do so I think and and he would respect that so I think your husband has a skewed idea of his role as well as your role as a helpmate you are his trusted ally you are his trusted buddy, you are his trusted friend. And, and even for me on my team, if I were to have an idea, we have team meetings every week. If I were to have an idea and my team said, no, Leslie, I don't really think that's a good idea. I think this, 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 I would listen. I would not say I'm the boss. I get 51%. You won't get 40. I mean, that just kind of doesn't sit well with me. So I would be really cautious about that mindset that you have to listen to me no matter what, even if I'm driving the car straight off the cliff, I get the final say. That's saying that your input is not as valuable as mine. And I don't think that's true. I don't think God wired men to be smarter than women or men to have more capacity than women in every area. They have more capacity in certain areas and women have more capacity in others. And so that's why the submit to one another and yield to one another and learn from one another and speak to one another in love is so important, especially in marriage. So that's my two cents on it. He's not going to agree so that you have to decide where you land on that. All right. Any other questions? I don't see them. I have some older questions that I'm going to answer real quick before I go. Oops, I think you took them off, Karen. <laughs> they were older questions on here, so I just went to the ones from the chat. So if anybody has any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But for now, it looks like we're good. So I'm just going to encourage you to sign up for the Conquer Workshop. We are not doing any Facebook Lives over the Easter weekend. We are giving you a opportunity to um, be present to today, uh, even today and tomorrow, uh, Good Friday and the Easter weekend. Um, however, you use that to remind yourself of the sacrifice of our Lord, as well as um, how he willingly entered into suffering, not because he was helpless and didn't have a choice. He had a choice. He willingly entered into suffering for what? For our good, not for the abuser's good, for their good too, for forgive them for they know not what they do, but not to enable them to be more cruel and abusive. And they were, they were to him, but for the greater good of defeating Satan and saving us. And so understand that Jesus often, if you read through the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus often fled from those who were seeking to harm him. So when people tell you, oh, Jesus suffered, you should suffer. Yes, he suffered for a greater good right? For a greater good. But he didn't always suffer. When the Pharisees were planning to kill him or throw him off the cliff or do other things, psh, he was gone. The prudent see danger and take refuge. He didn't just let himself suffer. He chose. Jesus says, no one took my life. I gave it. I gave it. And he wrestled about that in the garden, remember? And then he made his choice. So when you don't have a choice and you don't have a voice and you feel like a prisoner and you are trapped into compliance, do not label that biblical submission. That's not biblical submission. Biblical submission is important. But when you are coerced and you have no voice and no choice and you are forced to do things you don't want to do and you don't think are wise or that are hurting you or others, just to enable your husband to do what he wants to do. That's not a noble sacrifice. And so let's remember that this Easter weekend. All right, we do have one or two more questions. Let me just get that and I will then move on. Um, I have lots of questions all of a sudden. <laughs> um, hold on. How should I approach my kids when he refers to me with derogatory names via texts? My kids are teens. I would definitely approach your kids. So um, I would approach him with the evidence. I notice that dad is texting you with nasty names about who I am or what I've done. 
And I just want you to know that I think it's really important that you love your dad and respect him, but what he's doing is wrong and I'm not okay with it. And he and I are having some struggles and, you know, I want you to love your dad and I want you to respect and love him. And I want you to respect and love me too. And it's not okay that he's doing this. That's putting you in the middle and I don't want you to be in the middle. That's all you have to say. And then you need to go to him and say, this is not okay. And you need to stop doing it. He may not, but then start documenting it so that if you have to use that as an, an attorney, pre-divorce stuff that he's doing to alienate the children is much more powerful than during divorce. So it's really important for you to get that documented. Um, I was in a relationship for six years without any affection, broke up last September, and I'm still struggling and crying over the loss of that relationship. He was so indifferent to my feelings and friends say it was not healthy. Why do I still struggle still? Well, that's a good question. That's a really good question to sit with and be curious about. You know, David asked himself that question, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? So reflecting on why am I pining after somebody who doesn't want me? Why am I still wanting someone who is rejecting me every single day? Hmm, that's really curious. What is it about that relationship that reminds me of another relationship? Oftentimes, when we get into these relationship patterns, we're trying to recreate something from our childhood. It's called relation, what's it called? Repetitive trauma. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who recognized that, that she was trying, her father never loved her. Her father never loved her well. So she kept picking men like her father, thinking, okay, I'm grown up now. Now he'll, you know, and not thinking consciously, but now I'm going to get him to love me. I'm going to get him to love me. I'm going to get him to love me because he, because I, I didn't get my father to love me. So there must've been something wrong with me. So now I'm going to get a man like my father to love me to show that there was nothing wrong with me. Well, she still couldn't get those guys to love her. And it was, it was a powerful wake up call for her to realize that this was a, you know, a repetition trauma of her, her childhood, trying to get this father figure type to, to love her, to heal the wound of her childhood. When this, same old kind of guy, which was probably a narcissist, was never going to love her, and they still weren't. Not because she was unlovable, but because this kind of person is incapable of love, right? And so I think this is something that maybe you would find some therapy helpful. Okay. Married at 24, I'm 38. I have, feel I have wasted my young years every day. I am working on my plan to leave. I feel like I'm always living on the future. How do I not beat myself up for the years I've wasted? I feel old. How to enjoy my life again? Girlfriend, I am, you are not old. <laughs> 38 is not old. Um, so here's, here's what I'm gonna show you. Okay, you're telling yourself a story here that is affecting here. All right, so the facts are that you married at 24, all right? You've been married for 14 years, 38. And I bet you've learned a lot in those 14 years, both positive and negative. You learned about what you don't want in marriage, what doesn't work for you, what you like, what you don't like, who you are, who you're not, who he is, who he isn't. Maybe you have a couple kids in that bunch of 14 years, and that might be a blessing. So don't say that was wasted. It wasn't wasted. You grew up. You got smarter, I hope. <laughs> right? So don't, don't. Tell yourself a story that because you didn't marry the perfect person the first time, there is no perfect person, by the way, but you did grow and you did learn. And there were some good things that came out of those 14 years. Change the story, change your life. All right. So change the story. You can't change the facts. You're married 14 years and most of them weren't happy, but there were some highlights, good things that came out of that, including your growth. Change your story about those years. That's your first step. Okay. So you have not wasted your years. These years between 20 and 30 are learning and growing years. And between 30 and 40, they are learning and growing years. They're not wasted if you learned and grow, grew, even if it was painfully. All right? If you didn't learn and grow, then they're wasted. But if you're learning and growing, then they're not wasted. All right? I'm telling my story that I'm old at 38. You are not old at 38. You're not even halfway through your lifespan. So you're telling yourself a story that's affecting your outcome. But it's not true. All right. So now you're beating yourself up because you're telling yourself the story that you wasted your year, years. It's not true that you wasted your years if you learned and grew through them. But even if you did make some stupid tax mistakes during those 14 years, all right, if you learn from them by 38, you're ahead of the game because many people don't learn from them until they're 60. 
right? <laughs> Until they're, you know, kind of sitting on their seat, reflecting on their life. They don't learn from them. So be glad that you've learned from them at 38. That's not too late or too old. So be careful of how you're framing what happened because you're framing it in such a negative way that you can't help but feel bad. But if you framed it differently, wow, I am only 38. I've got more than half of my life left to live the way that I choose. I need to figure out who I am, what I value, what's important to me, and how to create a day today. I'm going to take charge of today. How do I want today to go? Hmm. I think I want to take a walk. I think I want to sit in the sunshine. I think I want to call a friend. I can even make today a better day. And if I just live on default, I wasted today. Well, you don't have to waste today. You can decide this morning how you want to live the rest of your day. You don't have to live the rest of your day in this negative story if you choose not to. So those would be tools that I would help you use to begin to get out of the story that you're in, which is pretty negative, and begin to create a new story of, Curiosity, what can I learn? How can I grow? How can this help me be a better, stronger woman? How can I help others through this? And now, I've got a whole life to do this. A whole life to do this. And I think that's pretty cool. All right. How do you have physical intimacy if it's only level two relationship? Another person asked, what about sex with an indifferent husband? Yeah, those are really hard questions because uh, if it's... So for some people they can do it because they can have a more physical needs approach to sex and that I have physical needs and you have physical needs and we can do that in a non-shaming, non-dangerous, unsafe, safe way that works for both of us. And we can still enjoy that part of our relationship, even though we can't talk. Um, that is a way that we can feel connected and close. People have been doing it that for years and been okay with that, and some people can't. So you have to decide whether that's okay or not okay with you. And if it's not okay with you, I think it's okay to say so, that I don't feel I can be physically intimate when I don't know you and you don't know me. I don't feel safe to do that. I feel like a prostitute. That would be you, but that might not be every woman or every man. Men seem to be able to do that easier than women, but not every woman. Some women I have talked to have said, They've had a great sex life, even though they had a horrible marriage. And maybe that's the one bright light in the whole shebang. I don't know. It's not for me to judge. That's for you to decide. So I'm not saying wrong, right, good, bad. I'm saying notice, be curious. How does that affect you? How does that impact you? And does it meet one need and then create other problems or does it not even meet that need sexually? So you decide what's okay and not okay for you. I've determined that I need to leave. I have been successfully disconnected while still living together for the last four years out of a 15 year marriage. I have done my best to be kind, but not Jade, justify, argue, defend, or explain, or engage. He has made no attempts in four years to address this, other than occasionally saying, I treat him like a nanny <laughs> when I do things to meet my own needs or our family's needs, three small children. Long story short, I have been advised that a next and potentially final step is to ask him to meet with me and our pastors. They are safe people. I've been asked to be ready to call him out on the very hurtful things he has done and never taken responsibility for or shown any remorse for. I'm tempted to instead just take the blame for the fall of our relationship and divorce in hopes that it makes our co-parenting more successful and less terrible, but afraid that makes me not a truth teller in God's eyes. Hmm. Yeah. I think you're telling yourself a story that may or may not be true. And, and you're telling yourself an outcome that may or may not be true that's giving you some comfort. Uh, so let's go back to our chart. <clears throat> The facts are you've been living in a loveless marriage for a long time. The facts are that you are going to be leaving, that you have disconnected. You've been living four years in the desert where there's been no water, no change. Your pastors are supportive. <clears throat> you're thinking that if you take that step to leave, you're telling yourself a story. If I just leave without making him the bad guy and I'll be the bad guy, then we will co-parent peacefully and successfully. 
I'm not sure that's true. Because I think once you leave, you may have enraged the monster that then makes you the bad guy and makes you the bad guy in front of your kids and alienates your kids from you. So I'm not sure that that story is going to end the way you think it's going to end. And I'd be very concerned about that, especially if you're taking the bad guy role and your kids blame you for the breakup of their family and being a mean mom and not loving dad and not giving dad another chance and not being honest with I can see this really blowing up long term. So I think you need to rethink that maybe God is giving you an opportunity to say, you know, I don't want to change you. Um, that's not my job to change you, but I can't live with you the way you are. And things that you've done have been hurtful and wrong, and you've never owned them. And I don't know where to go from here. So now you're not the bad guy anymore. You're the wife who's saying, I don't want to be your nanny. <laughs> and I don't want to be your policeman. You decide the kind of man you want to be. And if you don't want to be whatever he did, faithful, loving, safe, kind, if you don't want to be those things, um, I, 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 you know, and maybe not even offering a reconciliation. I have decided I don't want to live together anymore because you don't want to change. And that's fine. That's your choice. You've shown me that over four years, but I don't want to pretend. And that might be more an honest way to end it where you're not demonizing him, but you're not taking the blame either. Those are just my two cents. So mull it over, talk it over with wise others who really know your situation and pray about it and see what God says. <clears throat> After 14 years of marriage, I feel like I've wasted my... Oh, I already did that one. <clears throat> what addiction makes staying different? Is it foolish? Um, addiction, depending on how addicted he is and the danger you're in financially or emotionally or physically in his addiction, I think staying well is probably not as easy and may not even be as possible as if someone's just couch potato and checked out in front of the TV and indifferent that way. Okay. My husband refuses to give compliments or encourage me. He will also not admit he's wrong or apologize. I tried to talk to him about this, but now he's not speaking to me. <laughs> what do I do now? He's quick to give criticism. So he's not speaking to you as a tactic. Can you recognize the tactic? He's punishing you for telling him something that bothered you and made him maybe feel bad, but he's punishing you. And he's going to do it in a way that's going to say to you very loud and clear, don't ever do that again. So in other words, he's controlling you by his behavior. He's learning to control, or he's seeing if this will control you. If he punishes you, whether he punishes you by smacking you for saying something, or he punishes you from the silent treatment, it's still a punishment. And if it works, then he's got a strategy working, a more covert strategy, but it's working. So I might just take a chance and say, I know what you're doing. You're punishing me for talking to you about my feelings. And it's not going to work because we can't have a marriage where I can't be honest with you about my feelings. So you decide where you want to go from here. And, you know, say it with a loving heart, but I'm not, I, I see your game and I'm not playing. No, I wouldn't say it that way, but that's what you're communicating. And that may cause them to say, well, I don't like that you said that. Well, I can understand that you wouldn't like it, but I'm saying it not to hurt you. I'm saying it because it's hurting our marriage. And if I can't say things that I think are hurting our marriage, then I don't know how we fix anything. You know, it's like telling you that the house has termites and that hurts your feelings. If the house has termites, we need to fix it or it's going to get worse. And if you don't want to hear those things, I don't know how we live together in a good way and make a long-term marriage. And I think those are, those are, realities that he may need to ponder if he's willing, but um, if he can't let you say those things and he's going to try to punish you for doing it and you get punished and you start saying, okay, talk to me, please talk to me. Okay. But you can't ever say that again. He won't say that, but that's the message. And then you're going to get like a frog in boiling water, sicker and sicker. So don't go that direction. All right. Where's a good place to go to, for help with intimacy avoidance? 22 years of marriage, relationship changed on day two. Um, I'm reluctant to say, because I've had some women who have not been happy with certain places that are typical places that people go, um, and they haven't been happy for good reasons. So I'm reluctant to do that. 
But I guess my first step would be to say, if your husband is interested in changing that, maybe that would be a good thing for him to research. If you're trying to drag him there, um, that's probably not going to work much because people who avoid intimacy uh, don't want to change usually. And if he wants to change, then maybe saying, well, why don't you ask around of some places that we might get some help? Um, so that's that's all I'm going to say on that because I just – I. I don't want to put my name behind an organization that I've heard some negative things from that uh, our Conquer women have been unhappy with. So I, I try to be uh, respectful of that. Um, she wants to follow up on her previous question about her husband not leaving willingly. We have not had sex in over a year, but my husband would wake me up in the middle of the night before my 12 hour shift and want sex. If I said no, he would sulk and make me feel inadequate. What's wrong with him? <laughs> um, obviously he's not, healthy, but I would say that the better question to ask yourself is what's wrong with me? Like, why am I putting up with this? What do I need to change? What do I need to work on? What do I, what boundaries do I need to have in place? What do I need to do? Because you're not, whatever's wrong with him, you're not going to fix it. You're not going to fix it. So whatever's wrong with him is hurting you. And what I want to ask you is why aren't you doing what you need to do to get healthy and strong? This was a, a, a workshop that I did a, a couple of months ago. When I'm not okay, when he's not okay, I'm not okay either. And so, what we want to do is we want to try to fix the other person so that they feel so we feel better. So I'm going to fix your, you know, narcissism so that you're a better husband, so that I don't feel so lonely. Or I'm going to fix your, you know, sexual anorex, uh, anorex, intimacy anorexic so that I'm not feeling so lonely. So I'm going to fix you so that I can solve my problem. But rarely. Does that work? Another person is not your job to fix, nor are you powerful enough to fix another person, no matter what their problem is. If my husband needs to, you know, do physical therapy because he's got a bad hip, I can't do his physical therapy. He has to do his physical therapy. As much as I could drive him if he needed it, I couldn't do the physical therapy for him. He has to do it. And so for us women to try to think that we can change our husbands or make them change is living in a fantasy story that doesn't exist. You can be supportive, you can be a cheerleader, you can be helpful, but you can't make someone do the work that they don't even want to do. So I would encourage you, friend, change directions instead of trying to figure him out and change him, that you ask yourself, what's my problem with his problem? I don't feel safe. I don't feel loved. I don't feel connected. I don't feel... Um, that he cares about me. I feel angry. I'm bitter. I'm resentful. I'm scared. What is your problem with his problem? And then work on your problem because that's the only person you can work on. And as you work on your problem, it will shift the dance a little bit. And then you can begin to ask more questions about what to do next. All right. So I'm going to run and get on to other things. Have a wonderful weekend remembering the Lord, even though it might be family wise, not so wonderful that keep what matters most in the top of your mind. Um, and what matters most is our relationship with Christ, at least for me. And so if I can keep that in the front of my mind, sometimes the temporal things that are upsetting to me take a back seat. And that helps because life is hard. And in this world, you will have hard, Jesus says. So how do we not get sucked into the hole of hard? It's by remembering the big picture. Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians 4. So all right. That's what I'm going to do. Hope you can do it too. I'll see you on Monday. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.